struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name all alone he suffered everything to the howling mob he yielded he did not for mercy cry the cross of shame he took alone and when he cried it's finished he gave himself to die salvation's wondrous plan was done he could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free he could Amen, Gene. God bless you. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Amen. I'm glad my Savior is the Savior that he is. He died for our sins. He was made sin for us. I thank God that my sin has already been dealt with by one sacrifice, by one person forever. Thank the Lord for the gospel of the grace of God. All right, now tonight we're going to look again at the subject, more than one gospel in the Bible. Turn your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter number 24. Those that were, were here last week for our first study on this, We've already seen in that message that really in that one message alone, that's enough to prove the fact that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. But actually, there's a threefold argument from the Word of God to prove that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. For years, I thought that there was only one gospel. And I thought that, really, just simply because I did not know some of the things I'm going to give you tonight. I had never been able, really, to put the things together. And I'm not the only man that's ever seen this. It's not something that's unique with me. But I will have to admit it's something that many, many Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists don't know nothing at all about, and, of course, uh, some of the other groups uh, absolutely uh, would not, uh, none of them would know it. In Matthew chapter number 24, the Lord Jesus said in verse number 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now again, tonight we need to put just some basic things on the board to help us understand right division. These things will help us get into our thinking, into our thoughts, and retain in our minds some of the scripture verses. We're going to be covered also. A visual approach to things helps us kind of keep things in order. You notice the cross there on the left-hand side of our chart. That cross, of course, represents the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he came down from heaven's glory, made himself flesh, dwelt among men, they took him and put him upon the cross of Calvary. They crucified him. He was buried and he rose again the third day. We saw in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, and verses 1 through 4, that that's the very heart of the gospel of the grace of God which we preach. We saw that men have not always understood that gospel, 
And we saw that, frankly, very plainly, in the fact that Simon Peter and the apostles, some of the apostles, as they were told about that, they rebelled against the teaching of the cross. Whenever Jesus first mentioned the cross to Simon Peter, Simon Peter took the Lord, began to rebuke him, and said, Lord, be it far from thee, so that those men, whenever the cross was first mentioned to them back here, rebelled against the idea of that cross. Simon Peter knew nothing at all about the cross as late as Matthew 16, even though Simon Peter had been preaching a gospel earlier than that. Now, that was the burden of our last message. Now, the message tonight deals with a prophecy that you find in Matthew chapter number 24. Jesus said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now again, our elements here on our cross, on our chart. First of all, the cross. Death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, here you've got an arrow going up, a cloud, and meeting the arrow coming down. This, of course, is the church being caught out to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. Then after that, there's another period of time which separates this from the arrow coming down. This is a representation of the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth. You'll notice that there are some divisions here. Things are different before the cross from those after the cross. Things are different here uh, during this present age in which we live. They're different from these things that are going to be over here behind the rapture or after the rapture and before the second coming. And our message tonight, although it does not deal with it, we can also say that events after the second coming of Christ to the earth are different from events beforehand. Now, all of these particular time periods have particular doctrines that are unique to these times. And a child of God must know these, rightly divide the word of truth. He must know these and be settled in them really to understand and appreciate his Bible. In Matthew chapter number 24, you'll notice the context of this statement. I want you to turn, please, to the end of chapter number 23 and notice what the Lord has been talking about and what the context of this statement of enduring unto the end is. Look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to go back to heaven's glory. He has been preaching now and teaching now to Israel for over three years. The, although the common people, many of them have heard him gladly, yet the rulers of the nation of Israel remain in blindness and sin. The bulk of the nation refuses to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and heed his message. He stands then over the capital city and weeps over the city and says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered thee together, thy children together. And he said, Ye would not. The Lord Jesus has already told his disciples he is going to be going away. And now he says in verse number 39 to Jerusalem, Ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Then the Lord put a condition on his second coming back to this earth. The Lord Jesus said this, before he goes to the cross, he says, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together? And as he stood out there uh, over that city, just prior to him going back to heaven's glory, he wept over that city. What a magnificent thing it was as far as the prophecy of God's concern and as far as the work and the preaching that had been done in that city in centuries past. My, how God had blessed that city and God had sent prophet after prophet 
and God tried to gather Israel together in the sense that he sent them and they called to Israel and they didn't repent. Our Lord and Savior stood out over that city and he said, now Jerusalem, that's the capital city of Israel. You don't think about Israel about, without thinking about Jerusalem. He said, now ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord so that Israel is not going to see Jesus till, Jesus till Israel says about Jesus, blessed is he that come. Then whenever the Lord refers to Israel, then I know this, Israel is not going to see the Lord Jesus Christ in this church age. I know this, Israel is not going to see Jesus Christ when we go out to meet him. You see, whenever we go out to meet him, the Lord's going to catch us out. He's not coming back. But Israel will see the Lord Jesus Christ whenever he comes back to this earth, for Israel is going to say then, just prior to his coming, and I know it from his statement there, they're going to say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Israel is going to exclaim, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, and Jesus is going to come back. Who is going to say that? It's not the church. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not Millbrook. It's Israel that's going to say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's not the church, the body of Christ. It's Israel. It's Jerusalem, the capital city, that's going to say, Blessed. Well, then in Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And, for, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so here's the city, the temple there involved, and there's not going to be one stone left upon another which is not going to be thrown down. The temple in that city is going to be destroyed. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So here's a private Bible class now. Jesus and his disciples. And they said, tell us, when shall these things be? What things? Well, the things he's been referring to. When Israel is going to say, blessed, and when this temple is going to be destroyed, Lord, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, they wanted to know a lot, didn't they? They said, now, Lord, here we are. It's the Bible class time. And Lord now answered. The Lord didn't answer all their questions. We don't have time to go into that. The Lord answered what they needed to hear. And instead of the Lord telling them about the end of a world as such, the Lord Jesus Christ told them about his second coming, the things that would be involved in that second coming, for that's the issue he had brought up in Matthew 23. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 23 did not deal with the end of the world. We don't care what the Greek scholars say. We don't care what they do with the, with the word world there. They can run all the Greek they want to. The Lord Jesus Christ did not bring up the end of the world with him coming back to Israel. He's talking about him coming back here to this earth. And he said, you'll not see me till you say, blessed is he that cometh. So the disciples want to know a lot, and Jesus doesn't always answer the disciples. He doesn't always answer your question, doesn't always answer mine. Sometimes in the Bible, men had asked one question, the Lord would answer another. The Lord answers what you need to know. He does not answer things to satisfy just mere carnal curiosity. So the Lord Jesus Christ gives them an answer. It revol revolves, revolves around the sign of his coming, the second coming, and also the end of certain days which are related to that second coming. The end of the world has nothing to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The end of the world is on out yonder past the kingdom, past the millennial age. And the Lord Jesus just ignored that and went on and gave them what they needed. Notice what he says. In verse number four, uh, verse number five, he said, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And we're going to go just briefly through the context now and notice. So we're dealing here with people coming, saying, I am Christ, getting ready for the Antichrist, the man of sin. Notice in verse number 6, ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. I'll tell you this, there's going to be no peace upon this earth till Jesus comes. 
there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and we are living in this period of time after the cross and before the rapture. Here's where you live right now, my friend. And we live right here, and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. How do I know it? Because, brother, the period of time is coming. Jesus is talking about his second coming. And just before his second coming, there's going to be people arising saying that they are the Christ. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. Now, if there's wars and rumors of wars here, and there are, then there's going to be that much more over here. We're just getting ready for some things. Whenever you see wars and rumors of wars now, it's just getting ready for some real wars and rumors of war. By the way, the greatest world wars ever to be fought are still out in the future. They'll make the Civil War, World War I, and World War II look like a Sunday school picnic. Put them all together, and the wars that are yet to be fought in the future, brother, this world will see no peace until Jesus comes and until God takes care of things. Man will not bring about the end of war. Wars and rumors of wars. Notice in verse number, seven, verse number 6 again. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Who's the you? These men are Jews. They're Israelites. Israel is going to be hated like they've never been hated before. Uh, Hitler did not bring an end, or he was not the last uh, in the line of tyrants who were against Jews. Hitler did not end anti-Semiticism. Whenever Hitler committed suicide in his bunker there, he was not the last anti-Semitic. The Jews' greatest time of trouble and problem and hatred from Leaders, world leaders, and one in particular, is yet in the future. The Jew is not hated today to any degree like he's going to be in the future. Whenever Jesse Jackson made his remark about New York being Jaime Town, the Jews all got excited. I tell you, there's one worse than Jesse Jackson coming. He'll be a reverend too, but he won't just refer to them as Jaime's. He won't just do what Hitler did to them. He'll try to do much more. He'll rise up in hatred against Israel. And Israel will be hated not only by one nation, but all nations that give allegiance in that time of tribulation to the Antichrist. All those nations will join in a hatred for the Jew. And the Jew again will be driven out of Palestine with no help from the Gentile nations. She'll be driven out again and she'll have to turn to God for help. She'll turn her eyes toward heaven and begin to cry out in repentance and then turn and say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then that's when the Lion of, not the city of Chicago, but the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's one of the tribes of Israel, brother. He'll come out of heaven. God's not through with the Jew. Neither is the world. So they'll be hated of all nations. Verse 11 says, Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I've never told anybody in this age that in order for you to be saved, you've got to endure to the end of a period of time. But I'll guarantee you, under the gospel of the kingdom, men have to endure to a certain end. This has caused some people to take the Bible and say, now look, what you've got to do is you've got to endure to the end of your life. That is not what the passage says. That is not what the context is. The context is not to Gentiles in this age. The context has nothing to do with you being true to the Lord all the days of your life. It has to do with the nation of Israel in the tribulation period, and Jesus said it's a gospel of a kingdom. 
What is this gospel of the kingdom? Read it again. Look at verse 13. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel, do I preach that gospel? I certainly do not. I don't preach you have to endure to the end to be saved. I don't preach, and the gospel of God's grace does not teach me to preach that I have to endure to the end of anything in order to be saved. Instead, the gospel of God's grace tells me the moment I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, then God puts me into the body of Christ. I am bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, and nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Savior. I am in him. He is mine. I am his, eternally secure. And Philippians 1, 6 tells me that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And there's that day. Brother, the day of Jesus Christ is not here. The day of Jesus Christ to us, the church, is when we meet him in the air. And, brother, God's promised me that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Who began the work of salvation? I did not. Jesus did. Amen. Jesus saved me. I wasn't saved by joining a church, getting good, being baptized, giving money to the church, and stopping my cussing and my lying and all of that stuff. I was saved by the grace of God. Don't you see it? Don't you see it? And if I was saved by the grace of God, if it's by grace, then is it no more of works? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. If I'm saved by the grace of God, I'll be kept by the grace of God. And he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. I am not told any place I have to endure to the end. Ah, but Israel is told. Jesus, as he stands here, says, I'm going away. And you're not going to see me, Israel, till you say blessed. Do you notice how the Lord said, till you say blessed? Well, they just cut out this age right here altogether. I mean, the Lord ignored the church age whenever we're called out to meet him in the air and went right to the time when Israel is going to be dealt with by Jesus Christ. The disciples said, Lord, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? They didn't say, Lord... <laughs> What about the church age? These men knew nothing at all about a church age. They didn't say, Lord, what about the 2,000 years there when America was going to rise? They knew nothing at all about that. They said, Lord, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And Jesus tells them about that coming. And he says, you won't see me again till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh. This has to do with the gospel of the kingdom. Now notice in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Notice it has to do with an abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And that is certainly not a man who has already stood in Jerusalem. And if it has any reference at all to a man who's already stood in Jerusalem in 70 A.D., it is simply because that man is a shadow or a type of the greater Antichrist who is to come. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, has not stood in Jerusalem to this day. But one day he will. He'll sit in the temple of God and make himself God and blaspheme and all the kings of this earth will give their allegiance to him and he will have money in his hand. As we said this morning, the love of money is the root of all evil the merchandiser of all the riches of this world who holds the riches of the kingdom of this world in his hand, the devil himself, he said to Jesus one time, fall down and worship me and all these kingdoms will be yours. The devil uses the offer of money to get you away from God and the devil hands out money to the nations of the world and he gives them a one world system of currency and money he controls it, and no man can buy, sell, or trade except he takes the mark of that beast, and that devil will control the money. The abomination of desolation will sit in that temple, and he will control the military, religion, economics, the whole shooting match. And brother, this world will fall for him head over heels. And that abomination of desolation will turn against the Jew, and with all of his confederacy... They will try to wipe the Jew from the face of this earth. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said in verse 16, Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. You're not talking about anybody in Chicago or New York. You see, the Jew then 
gets back to Jerusalem and he's back in Judea and he is going to be there so he can be driven out. You know why God's allowed the Jew to go back? You know why God allowed the nation of Israel to be proclaimed a nation in 1948? And why God's allowed such a such a influx back into that part of the country by Jews from all over the world? Do you know why Jews want to get back to Palestine? Do you know why they want to get back to their homeland? In spite of everything's been done to keep them out of there, do you know why they're there tonight? Because it's in the plan of God. This book said it. Jesus said there's going to be some in Judea. And let them that are in Judea, now some of my brethren who are dispensationalists, foul up on this. They think the Jews are back there and Jesus is going to come back. Everything's fine. No Jews going to be kicked out and then God's going to bring them back. God's going to gather them back. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that were child and to them that give suck in those days. Now the Lord's talking about some days. Those days. You see, we're dealing with the end of a certain period of days. Israel is going to go into tribulation, and they're going to have to endure to the end in order to be saved. And woe be to the man that doesn't endure to the end, as we'll see in just a moment. In other words, a Jew in the tribulation period will need Matthew chapter number 24 preached to him, hard, plain, clear, factual, uncompromisingly by somebody that knows their Bible. It won't be enough to preach the gospel of God's grace in the tribulation period, brother. They've got to be told they've got to endure to the end. You say, preacher, how can that be? Well, it's just simply because God doesn't deal with people the same way in all ages of time. And you ought to have enough sense to read your Bible and believe it and know it. Why, don't you know that Saul, as he stood over there, anointed king of Israel, the Spirit of God came upon him, and then Saul, as he rebelled against David and tried to kill David, the Word of God says the Spirit of God departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord came upon him. Didn't you read over there where David said in Psalm 51, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David saw it happen to Saul. I stand here tonight and I do not have to worry about God's Holy Spirit departing from me. I am concerned about grieving I am concerned about not being in fellowship with him, but I have been sealed by the Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. That's what my Bible tells me. Amen. I don't go around praying, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, even though a great man like David prayed it. That's not my prayer and your prayer in this age. Whenever we're called out, that work of the Spirit of God of indwelling permanently, sealing, and baptizing into the body of Christ, that work goes out with the church, brother, because we're the only group of people that experience that. We are the body of Christ. We've been made to drink into one spirit, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. The blessed spirit of God dwells within us permanently. He'll, that ministry will go out. And during that time, brother, Israel stands there, and God is going to deal with them and they are going to have to do some enduring unto the end. Now, men don't believe what the book says, and that's when it gives them trouble. You get a man this age, gets saved by grace, and he won't believe what God says about Israel over here in the tribulation period. Now, the way you get an unsaved cult member in this age is he takes something God said to Israel and takes it literally, and then he runs over here and tries to tell us that that's what we're supposed to be doing this age. Why, these cults run over and say, why, he says, endure to the end, thou shalt be saved. You're going to have to endure to the end. We say, hey, wait a minute, man, something ain't jiving. And we give them Paul's script, and they say, well, now, that's not exactly what it means. They believe these literally take these figuratively. <laughs> Brother, the Bible believers believe all of them literally, but rightly divide the word of truth. Get them in the right place, and there's no problem. Try to mix them all up and make them a spiritual casserole, and you got trouble. You got weakened down, watered down preaching that amounts to nothing. I heard a leading preacher the other day. I listened to a tape, one of his services, 
And he said, in our church, some of our leading, faithful, good men have gone off into the charismatic crowd. Well, no wonder. That leading preacher knows nothing at all about right division. All he knows is just stamping and stomping his foot and hollering, waving and swearing up and down that the Catholics and the charismatics are wrong and that you ought not do it and so forth. He knows nothing at all about Acts chapter number 2. He's built his church on Acts 2. Well, if you build your church on Acts 2 and some charismatic preacher comes along and says, well, now they spoke in tongues in Acts 2. If Acts 2 is the pattern, let's go at it, boy. Well, as a child of God learned something about right division, he's had it. And some of these bird brains come along and tell you, look, you've got to endure to the end to be saved. The Bible says so. And if you're not grounded in right division, you're liable to go off fun. I believe some of God's people get fouled up in a mess like that because the pulpit doesn't straighten it out and preach to them and give it to them even though it's difficult. Man, I'll tell you, I go someplace and I preach and I get airs going, things going, lines going. Man, this is a masterpiece right here compared to some of my dootsies. I go to some of these places and I preach, man, and, and get going and the lines start going. If somebody came in the middle of the thing, they'd think I was drawing a schematic for a radio transmitter. And it's a, it's a wonder God take anything. I mean, this is, this is simple up here. But you know, no matter how simple you keep it, some of God's people are so ignorant of the Bible, they have not read the Bible enough that they can't even get simple division. Now, if you can't see that there's a difference between Matthew 24, verse 13, and Philippians 1, 6, you need to have your eyesight or your heart checked out. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's a difference. Both are true. You just got to get them in the right place. Notice in verse number 21, same passage, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You ever thought about all the things and trouble and problems come upon this earth? I'll tell you, a worldwide flood came to this earth in Genesis chapter number 6, and Jesus said the tribulation period is going to be worse than that worldwide flood, universal flood. Brother, that's something. Then that means this old world's got a bad day of coming. You'll notice down in verse number 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God's got a right to run that thing longer, but the days are shortened in that tribulation period. And for the elect's sake, there's a certain group that's going to come out of that thing. Those that endure to the end, you're going to have some coming out of that thing and enduring to the end. The days are shortened. But if those days were not shortened, it's so bad. Everything that has breath would die. Well, you see, it's, it's not uh, sometimes death is a pleasant relief. Back there in Genesis 6, everything that has breath perished except eight souls that were in the ark. More people died in Genesis 6 than are going to die over in that tribulation period. But I guarantee you, that death of drowning, brother, that's a merciful thing compared to what's going to happen in that tribulation. Men will cry and scream for death, and they won't die. Why, have you, have you ever thought about it? One of the worst things in the world is want to die and can't. I've heard of people in hospitals and had a couple of personal acquaintances with folks who were so sick they wanted to die. And were praying to die and ready to die. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to want to die and pray to die and, and in so much agony and pain and you can't? That's the way it's going to be in that tribulation period. Verse 24, there shall arise false Christ, false prophets. Verse number 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Brother Jesus' second coming is related to these days. Notice in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Well, that's the days he's talking about. Enduring to the end of days. Enduring what? Those days of the tribulation period. What do these people got to endure? 
What do they have to endure? Turn your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation, the book of the Revelation deals with the events just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then, of course, his second coming, and then the things after. So whenever you read the book of the Revelation, you're dealing with things that happened, tribulation period, second coming, and things afterwards. The book of the Revelation, then Revelation chapter 14, you're reading about the tribulation period. What do men have to do? Listen to it. Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Notice, please, something. You have got an angel here. And uh, this angel is flying through the heavens. And this angel is preaching. This angel is preaching and he preaches to every nation. Every nation. Keep it in mind, please. He preaches to every nation. What does he preach? Notice, he preaches to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Brother, I can't say the hour of God's judgment has come. You see, you might be given another hundred years on this earth. You may be given another five seconds. I don't know. I can't say the hour of God's judgment has come. Brother, you see, whenever Jesus catches the church out, that's not the hour of God's judgment. But brother, whenever that tribulation period comes and the Lord Jesus Christ comes down to this earth and he is going to sit on his millennial throne and divide the nations and judge them like a man would divide sheep from goats, the hour of his judgment is come. Brother, whenever we caught up and meet the Lord in the air, we'll stand the judgment seat of Christ, but that's only saved people. Brother, this world is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge of this world, whenever he comes back. And that's not the great white throne judgment. More than one judgment in this Bible. And they say the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You know you've got angels flying through the heavens. You say, preacher, do you believe that literally? Yes, yes, yes. What is it if it ain't an angel? What is it, a Chevrolet car? If it ain't flying through heaven, is it digging under the ground like a mole? God said what he wanted to say, said exactly what he meant, gave you exactly what's going to take place, brother. An angel's going to fly through the heaven, and he is going to preach the everlasting gospel to every kindred, to every nation, to every tongue. He'll have no problem with languages. Angel doesn't have to go to language school. Another angel follows and says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Verse 9, the third angel followed them. Notice now what this third angel says. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel, the presence of the Lamb. Brother, any man that does not endure to the end and resist the mark of the beast will go to hell and burn. Now, why can't you believe that? Why can't people believe that? I preach this message with some fundamental Baptist preachers around, and some of them get all excited, tore all to pieces. They can't see it. What's wrong with it? How, how is it hard to see? And I'll tell you what's hard about it. They want to make everybody get saved the same way and have to do the same thing all the way through time. They're kidding themselves, and they're fooling themselves, and you can't handle the Bible like that and get away with it. God's going to hold you to account one of these days. Now, I didn't learn this in seminary. I graduated from Tennessee Temple Theological Seminary, and I didn't learn it there. No man knew it because no man told it to me. Any man had known it, he had said something about it. I didn't learn this. You know where I learned this? Studying the Bible myself. You don't, you don't get it from the schools. 
Well, I'll just interject this. The most blessed thing of Bible study and the most blessing is this. Whenever you open up your Bible and you decide, I'm going to believe the Word of God myself, and I am going to get in that book and I'm going to start reading it, God start teaching you something. Well, that's the blessing. Can you see it that if a man receives the mark of the beast, then he goes to hell? And that ain't purgatory. There ain't no purgatory in this Bible. Once a man is in hell, that's it. Once a man gets the mark of that beast in the tribulation period, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's the sin unto death. No need to pray about it. When a man takes that mark of the beast, right there on his forehead or in his hand, that's it. He is going to hell, the wrath of God. He could pray and cry and plead all he wants to. That book says, if any man worship the beast in his image, then he's gone. He's going he's to be tormented with fire and brimstone. God never tells you in this age, look, if you cuss now, you ain't going to get saved. The Word of God doesn't tell you that there's anything in this age that you can do That'll put you in hell forever. The Word of God doesn't say, if you commit adultery, that's the unpardonable sin, and God's going to throw you in hell. We got some ignorant preachers running around preaching that. Right, God doesn't say that if you haven't done what you ought to have done the past 10 years, you committed an unpardonable sin, you're going to die and go to hell. You know what this book says? Turn to Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 20. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 20. Romans chapter number 5 and verse 20. Listen to what Paul said to us in this age. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace did much more abound. Where your sin has abounded, I want to tell you something. God's grace has much more abounded far above it, below it, and around it. I don't care how wide the boundaries are. Bring the biggest cursor, bring the biggest blasphemer, bring the adulterer, bring the whoremonger, bring the harlot, bring all of them. Bring the God cursor and bring them to the cross and if they'll trust Jesus tonight, every one of them will be saved and be in heaven, brother. Not a one will perish. That's the gospel of God's grace. Oh, that's what makes it so great. And that's, that is a terrible, awful thing for me to have such a great truth and not give it to other people. Oh, listen, what a great thing that anybody can be saved. Makes no difference what your past has been. Ah, oh, but listen, in that tribulation period, if I was one of God's preachers standing over there knowing the book of the Revelation, I'd have to say and preach with trumpet tones, I'd have to give out a warning, look, if you take that mark of the beast, you can't be saved. You've got to endure to the end. And if you don't, you'll drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without indignation into the cup. Look, please, in your Bible, again at Matthew chapter number 24. In Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. All right, Jesus said, this gospel will be preached in all the world. It'll be preached not only in all the world, but for a witness unto all nations. And what will happen? Whenever that occurs, then the end will come. Now, I want you to turn, please, in your Bible to the book of Romans and look at Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. And while you're turning there, may I just remind you that the Apostle Paul is saved in Acts chapter number Nine. Paul goes out and he begins preaching. Paul's ministry is separate from the ministry of the twelve for a definite purpose. Paul, whereas Peter in 
Matthew 16 rebelled against the cross and said, Lord, be it far from thee. And in Acts chapter number 2, Peter did not tell anybody that Christ died for their sins. Whereas Peter, and if you don't believe it, read it, study it. He never tells anybody Christ died for anybody's sins in Acts 2. God saves Paul and gives Paul the gospel of the grace of God, and Paul says, here is what happened at the cross. How did Paul get that? The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory revealed to him the gospel of the grace of God for this age. The apostle Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Paul gloried in the cross in Galatians 6, and Peter was ignorant of the cross in Matthew 16. He rebelled against it and ignorant of it in Acts chapter 2. Paul gloried in the cross. You know what Paul said about the preaching of the cross? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Brother, we don't rebel against the cross. We preach it. We understand what happened. Jesus was made sin for us there. It was because of his work that I go free. Ah, you see, God's given to us great blessings in this age of grace. Notice, please, in Romans chapter number 15. Paul said in Romans uh, 16, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 16. Paul said in Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Let me ask you folks, according to that statement, how do you get established? You get established by Paul's gospel. He said, my gospel. He's not being proud and assuming something that God has not given to him. Paul said, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. And watch now, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Oh, you see, God gave to Paul a mystery and revealed it to him. And now Paul preaches Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He does not preach Jesus Christ like Peter handled the cross in Matthew 16 when he, Peter said, Lord, be it far from thee. No, we glory in the cross. It's the preaching of the revelation of the mystery, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We glory in what Jesus did here. You see, he said, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And notice what he puts last for establishing you in this age and by the scriptures of the prophets. You know what most people do? Most people ignore Paul and go to the prophets, Old Testament, and try to get established. And then, after going to the prophets, then they'll run to Paul and let Paul fit in wherever he can. Ah, uh, that's not the order God gives. Paul said, Now to him is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, not like Peter did, but according to the revelation of the mystery and, and by the scripture of the prophets. We don't ignore the rest of the Bible. We just say, if you want to get established, you start here. This is what God's given to you in this age. And just like, listen, if Israel wants to be established in the tribulation period, they better go to the doctrine that relates to that period of time, brother. They better not go to Paul's writings. They better go to the doctrine that relates to that period of time and get established and, brother, then move out from there. Rightly divide the word of truth. Notice now in verse 26 again, but now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations. Listen to me. Paul said, my gospel has been made known to all nations. Did you get that? The gospel of the grace of God has gone to all nations. It's already gone. Now, I'm not saying we're not to go to this generation. There are lost people all around us who've been born. 
and will die and go to hell unless they hear the gospel. But I'm going to tell you this. A condition of Jesus Christ coming back to catch the church out is not that the gospel's got to go to all nations. I don't care how many new tribers preach it. Let them all teach it. They're wrong, wrong, wrong. Amen. The gospel's already gone to all nations. Paul told you it had in Romans 16, and that was in the first century, my friend. We're not waiting on anything for, to be done before Jesus comes back. How do they get these things? You know how they get it? By mixing up Paul's gospel with tribulation gospel. That's how they get it. You see, certain things have got to be done before Jesus comes back here. But nothing must be done before he comes back here. The rapture has no conditions attached, brother. You don't know when it's going to occur. Paul commended some saints in the first century for waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. He did it by inspiration. If it's right for them to wait in the first century, brother, it was right. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said, here's the sign of my coming. That's not this coming. That's the coming to Israel in Matthew 24. Here's the sign of it. And here's what's going to happen. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Brother, Israel never did receive the gospel of the kingdom. God dropped the apostle Peter, and you couldn't find Peter after Acts chapter number 15 if the Roman Catholic Church sent 25 cardinals to help you. You won't find him. God dropped him. God took up the apostle Paul. Why did he do that? That's because there's a bunch of heretics going to get over in Rome and tell you they're the mother church. It's a mother church, all right. It's the mother of all harlots. That's a harlot church. We have no part of it. It has no part with us. We're not bone of its bone and flesh of its flesh. We are of a different body altogether. We do not claim Peter as our leading spokesman. We say it's Paul. God's given you an answer to all the heretics and occults. If you'll listen to him, consider what he says. God will give you understanding in all things. The Catholic Church tonight on the face of this earth has it as, as its great uh, primate. <coughs> it has as that great primate, that great cussing apostle who had a wife, Simon Peter. Yeah, he was a cusser. He cursed and said, I don't know the Lord. Sure he was. The Roman Church collects a man that didn't even know what happened at the cross. He had to go to Paul and learn about it. Simon Peter in Acts chapter number 15, before he passes out of the scene, he said, well, he said, we believe uh, through the grace of God they should be saved even as we. And he had to say that after Paul had told him what had happened among the Gentiles. Peter learns from Paul. It's not the other way around. Paul said that gospel has already gone to all nations. Jesus said when the gospel of the kingdom goes to all nations, then the end will come. I'm going to ask you this. If the gospel was the same, and if there's one gospel all the way through there, and Paul's gospel is no different from the gospel the Lord Jesus preached, the gospel of the kingdom, then when the gospel of the kingdom went to all nations, then the end was going to come. Let me ask you why. If the word of God says the gospel went to all the nations in the first century, why the end ain't come yet? If it's the same gospel, the words of God mean nothing. Close up your book, forget about it, go on. Nobody knows anything. Jesus was just playing word games. If my Lord and Savior tells me, look, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached to all nations, then the end's going to come. Brother, I believe the Lord's going to bring about the end. I don't believe he's going to wait around no 2,000 years. That angel runs through the heavens up there, flies through the heavens without wings, by the way. He flies through the heavens and he preaches the gospel of the kingdom to every nation. And then the end comes. Read about it in the book of the Revelation. It's the hour of his judgment, brother. Fast on the heels of that angel, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back from heaven's glory as the lion of the tribe of Judah with blood on his garments. Brother, bringing vengeance God's wrath upon his enemies. Turn your Bible, please, to the book of Colossians and look at Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are in Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in where? All the world. Brother, the gospel of the grace of God's already gone to all nations and already gone to all the world. If that gospel of the grace of God which Paul preached was the same as the gospel of the kingdom, the Lord would have been obligated in the first century to bring about the end of all things. But God's given you a great proof, not only from the word of God, but also from experience that the end has not come. You see, no wonder why these birds get to where they believe the second coming of Christ is spiritual. You know you've got some theological nuts that run around tonight and they teach you the second coming of Christ has already occurred and you missed it. They teach it was a spiritual coming. It was somehow there, but you didn't see it and nobody knew it, didn't make any difference on this earth. Well, brother, for my part, if that's the second coming of Christ, I don't want nothing to do with it. Brother, if, if the Word of God doesn't mean what it says, whenever it says he comes back and his garments are stained with blood as a, as a man that's been treading in the wine press and with blood up to his garments, brother, uh, where his enemies have been trampled under his feet, if the Word of God doesn't mean that, brother, I'd start preaching. This book means it. He's going to roar out of heaven, and whenever he roars out of heaven, the nations on this earth are going to tremble. You see, this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. That's what Jesus said. Well, that gospel didn't go to everybody. It stopped because Israel would not receive it. God saved Paul and gave him the gospel of the grace of God, and Paul went with the gospel to all nations and to all the world in the first century. He preached the gospel of the grace of God so that that went out in the first century. This is a different gospel from that gospel. If it was the same, then God would have been obligated to bring about his second coming in the first century. Brethren, it must be two different gospels. Now let me ask you something. Have you really, really, really believed the gospel of the grace of God. You young people, adults here tonight, let me ask you, have you really trust Jesus who died for you upon the cross of Calvary? Do you really know what this book means when it says in Romans chapter number 5 and in verse number 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Do you really know what that means? Does that speak peace to your soul? Have you already received it? Or are you a lost, hell-bound, even though you profess to be saved? What's the condition of your heart? Are you really saved? You don't have to know all the things of right division or to be saved. But my friend, one thing you must know, and that is that you were saved by the grace of God. Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day and you've trusted a living Savior, you might not be able to take these things and prove them and preach them. But you know one thing, you're not enduring to the end to be saved. 
and you're not trying to resist some kind of mark so that you'll stay in the body of Christ. You know you were saved by grace and you're kept by grace. Do you know that for sure? Or you think maybe you can add something to this glorious gospel of the grace of God and somehow get into heaven on what you do plus what Jesus did. The gospel of God's grace is if it's by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. You have no grace if you're trying to add your works to it in this age. Why not trust him tonight as your Savior? Let's stand together.